in order to avoid plastics in ending up in our oceans. We can also use mechanical recycling. But the problem is how can we sort out the, the material that is today in what Kenneth will talk about in pile two, today just incinerated or landfilled or at the worst case put as a leftover into our oceans. We would like to avoid that, of course. So Kenneth Karsgård from Rangsas Denmark will talk about the fair plastic concept, how we today can produce resources and create the value of something that totally has been of no value before. Thanks. And so interesting listening to you, Martina. Very, very uh, interesting things you are working with there. And as said, a compliment to what we're doing also. So um, I want to tell you a story. <laughs> and this is a, a story about plastic recycling and why the most obvious things sometimes can be the most difficult things to accomplish. <laughs> because this is really the story about uh, plastic recycling. So uh, I'm going to address three, the three questions inside of this. What is the obvious thing? Why is it difficult to accomplish? <laughs> and is it possible at all to accomplish this? So we will start in this order and this will lead us uh, at the end to talk about this concept uh, fair plastic. So what's the obvious? Yeah, the obvious is that the linear economy <laughs> do not have a future. Uh, we know this, all of us. Um, the let out of CO2 cost to this is, is huge. Um, I saw that now the best level for parts per million in a cubic meter of air of CO2 is 280. Uh, that's where we have the best level. But after the industrialization came and up to now, we now have 430 parts per million inside. So this is the consequence. When I was a boy, we heard about the consequences that we would come out of this, and now we are starting to see them and face them. And this is just uh, some, some few articles taken from a Danish newspaper, but not over a long time, just over a very few weeks, showing these uh, enormous consequences uh, that we are facing every day uh, due to this. So this is the obvious thing still. How does uh, plastic uh, relate in this? Yes, plastic definitely also have a negative contribution uh, towards all of this. I think one of the, the interesting things uh, mentioned in an article some time ago about plastic waste, that of all the billions of tons of plastic that we have produced since we started producing plastic, only 9% has been recycled. 12% has been burned. <laughs> the rest is still out there. I think this is scary numbers and it really tells uh, the story. So uh, what happens to the plastic then? Many times it ends like this. You know this. Terrible pictures happening uh, around the world. Uh, yes, it doesn't happen in our part of the country uh, or our part of the world. We mainly uh, incinerate it instead. Uh, but this is also now we are faced with leading to large CO2 let outs and having other consequences. And, and mentioning this as well, I think it's an important argument also is one thing is the let out of CO2 when we burn it. But we also have to dig up new oil to produce new plastic. And digging up new oil also involves a lot of CO2. So it's actually both parts coming together that has this major impact on letting out the, the CO2 from both sides. So it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's double jeopardy. So this has led to uh, political action, Not naturally. Now we are really facing this. And the uh, EU is very clear by 2030, 2030 we need to recycle 55% of all the packaging material. Uh, and uh, in Denmark, it's even we have set the hi score higher. We want to recycle 80%, and, uh, and this is coming in the other countries also. We need to move fast on, on this one. And there is a JRC report that has been made, uh, published by EU. I don't want to dive into the detail, but it's really validating why we have to do this. It's really setting the numbers of how much CO2 it's possible for us to save by going in this direction. So it's, it's really needed. 
Uh, just to put it in numbers, we, 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 we are able to understand. It corresponds to if you can move one ton of plastic waste away from incineration into a recycling process instead, you will save what corresponds to driving in an electric car for an entire year. <laughs> so just one ton. So it's just to set it in, in perspective. So it's, it's, it's really much. This is the question. This is the question to the obvious part. This is, this is obvious. We have to do something about it. So then the bigger question is why is it so difficult for us to accomplish? Why haven't we done it uh, when so much is happening around this? And it's really about understanding the problem here. What is the actual problem? And we are talking about, think we're talking about, we have a big pile of plastic that we need to do something about. But it's a little more complex than this. Actually, we have two piles <laughs> of plastic that we need to do something about. In, in Denmark, we have 340,000 tons of plastic waste per year. It's roughly the same figures in other Nordic countries. 30% uh, of those are recycled and 70% are burned. If we look at world figures, it's more 90-10, <laughs> actually. But we are quite good in Denmark on this, we believe. But look at the two piles. You see the difference? The 30%. Let's look at the small pile. Mainly looks like this. Uniform items. Uh, like the refund bottles, the PET bottles, I think Per talked about them, going in a system, foils, crates, so on. It's uh, easy to recycle. You have uh, a uniform end product. You have high traceability. So it's, it's easy. What's the result? The result is that it competes very well against the virgin material. That's why we are recycling this. It has a, it has a value. It's, it's feasible to do from an economical point of view. That's why we're doing it. Be aware here, uh, this is good. We have to continue to do this, but be aware of some greenwashing here. Because if somebody says that we are using from this pile and say we are making a difference, <laughs> we are making some shoes or some lids or something made from this pile, it's good, but you're not making a difference. We're doing exactly what we have been doing for the last 30, 40 years uh, from the beginning because it's feasible. Uh, but we still have to do it. Then let's take a look at the other pile. <laughs> Looks quite different. It's mixed dirty from household, from shops, from municipality, from construction, from industries that mix things and, and so on. Looks a bit like this. It's difficult to recycle. Many more processes, many more sorting steps needs to be taken inside of this to get it out, to get it clean. It's possible. We'll get back to this. But you then don't always get a uniform end product. You have many molecule types uh, coming together. It's more difficult. You don't have traceability. Also really a, a, a big issue. And the result here is, is the opposite to the other pile. It can't compete against the virgin, simply. So we are not doing it. <laughs> and that's the reasoning for us burning it instead or deposit it. It's simply not feasible, has not been feasible in the linear economy. See, there is um, the problem that it has a negative value. And, and we burn it. But, but the big problem here is, and that's what we really have to understand, we can only make a difference by starting taking from this pile. That's the only place, by moving things away from this pile. This pile is creating all the problems with plastic, in the seas, in the burning, all the pro plastic problems is from this pile. It's so very important uh, to understand. Let's dive a little more into it, because what's the task we are actually facing by recycling this pile. It's, 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 it's not easy. And, and one of the things I want to point out here is that collecting it and doing a pre-sorting, that's good, but that's only the beginning, and that's the easy part. That, that's, that's really the easy part here to collect it. But you have to imagine that you have to bring this enormous tonnage into new products, replacing a virgin product that's already there. And you have to imagine it's your, your factory, you're producing some plastic item bins or bottles, millions of tons, and you have to take away your virgin and take this <laughs> pile two material and replace it. It's a huge step to take for a producer to do this. It's not easy. We really have to understand this. This comes together with the other thing. You have to imagine how procurement is going on. A purchaser sitting in a public or a private company, what, what is decisive for his choice of a plastic product? It'll be something like, I want, the, um, I want the right quality, the highest quality, with maximum traceability that lives up to the standard, the norms, the regulation for this product that I have, and I want it at the cheapest price. That's how the procurement are working out there. And you can imagine that's not fitting very well with the material from pile two. 
that's more non-uniform, no traceability, and other things. Therefore, it's not chosen very often. So just some, some questions here for reflection, nothing else. I, I know the panel will dive deeper into it later, but just for reflection here, uh, because these are very important questions. How do we legislate? How do we set standards, norms, regulations for plastic products? How do we compete? How do we make the tenders? How do we compete in the, in the private sector? If we have to switch our mindset and, and know that we don't, we don't want to move the virgin material anymore, we need to move the pile too <laughs> instead. How should we do this? And, the, and the, the answer here is there is no answer right now. It, 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 takes, it, it demands huge changes uh, to make this circular transition all the way down to the system. It's not enough we just say it in the top. <laughs> we need to, it needs to come all the way down to the system because it's all around the other way of doing it. It's really, really in illustrated in, in this picture. I think others is also so showing it sometimes, but, but this is the purchaser standing here. He has the, the, the raw material coming from, uh, from, 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 the, from the virgin. It's easy to trace. He can, uh, he can follow it. It's the best price, limit, unlimited availability. And then he has to switch to the other products that's coming, no traceability from different sources, variating quality and so on. It, it's really, really difficult to switch this from, from, from targeting the origin or the traceability and more looking at, at quality and what is needed to be done. So, third question. <laughs> is it possible? <laughs> or should we leave it? Well, some would say that the bumblebee can't fly <laughs> and say that it's possible. The wings are too short, the belly is too fat <laughs> and so on. Um, but it flies. And I think that's really what we, uh, what we did in, uh, in Rang Cells. Uh, actually, starting in, uh, in 2014, we started working like a bumblebee <laughs> with this pile too. You can see it on the, on the left side, um, all the mixed dirty plastic. And this is just a collage of pictures. I don't want to dive into it. Uh, uh, 13 different partners are involved here in, in this thing we've been working with, trying to bring this dirty, difficult plastic that has been burned into new products. What have we succeeded with? What has been possible so far? Yeah, it has been possible to bring this kind of plastic. This is very poorly contaminated plastic coming from supermarkets. After a supermarket throws out the plastic, uh, or sorry, the organics in the evening, there's a packaging around it if it gets too old. This packaging, we can pile off, <laughs> we can take this off, it's contaminated, it's organically, it's mixed, but we are able to make bags out of it, or at least some part of it. We've also been able to make bins, or sorry, bottles, uh, for enabling to go back to the supermarket from the household collected plastic. So this is when citizens throw out their plastic. You see it in the pile, a lot of mixed plastic coming into uh, these kinds of, of bottles again. It's possible. Also, we have been able to make bins out of it again uh, like this. These are just few examples. We have made a lot more. I just want to show you some few examples of what's actually possible on this one. And I don't want to say that the trees are growing into the sky because there are still issues. It's not easy. We have quality issues. We have quality issue with uh, breakage in the, in the welding of the bottles because of mo too much PP content. We have problems with difficult molecules flow floating through a bin that makes it easier to break. We have problems with the fat still on the foil that uh, brings our pellets to boil up like popcorns. <laughs> We have problems with smell because uh, it's a very open molecule structure. So you get the organics, it's uh, molecules, the smelling molecules are going into the plastic, etc. So these are just few of the things we are facing. We are, we are handling them. <laughs> it's possible, but they are there and, and it's, it's, it's not easy. So it's just to say that we still have a lot way to go. So one of the things we also really found out about uh, in our project here is one thing is the technical issues, but another really important thing here is actually the value chains <laughs> or building the right value chains. And why is this? This is because if you don't have an entire value chain coming together from the producers of the waste, uh, the one that designs the material, to those that collects it, to those that again uh, use it to something that works with it to ending up in a shop again. If you don't close this entire value chain, it's almost impossible. 
So, so we've been working very hard with building value chains, also apart from just solving the technical things. One of the things, uh, value chains, we're actually very proud of is a thing, actually the Danish Environmental Department made this value chain, uh, making large supermarket chains in Denmark come together with partners like us, uh, making a, a, an, a goal to see how could we take more of the plastic that they produce in the shop and get it back on the shelves again. And one of the things we started by doing and have already done now is, is starting with the design of the plastic. You mentioned black. <laughs> We're trying to get the supermarkets and those buying it not to, to produce in black because we know it's a problem and many other things. So we made a design guide that's now available in Denmark for the entire industry to how to produce packaging material so it's easy to recycle. Don't use lamination, don't put, lam don't put paper on it, don't put different plastic types together, all these things. It's a guide lying there now available for everyone. Uh, and we are making more of those also for the packaging uh, material now. Next step is also working very closely together with the supermarket then to take the material back. We have already, already managed to get bags back on the shelves of Netto from this material. And we're working very hard now with Co-op. We have an actual project going on of getting bottles back on their sites uh, for, for these uh, kinds of things made from their own plastic again. And we're very far in this. So these are very important things. We're working together with the municipalities uh, to do this uh, as well. This is uh, an example from a Middelfart Kommune. They have chosen to they make a small green bag that people are using for organic waste. And they take this bag and uh, bring it to the citizens, they put organics in it, and we make this bag from the old plastic that we collect from this household again. So it's a circular thing for them, a uh, very big success. Then another uh, project we're, we're particularly proud of is, is what happened in the Rebil Kommune. And instead of, uh, of telling you about it, I want to show you. We made a small movie about it, so uh, let me show you this. Our resources is our future. Circular processes that harmonize with the beautiful circular ecosystem we live in. When we throw out plastic, in the right bin of course, many worry about where it all ends, and with good reason. Until now, a new and innovative partnership has made it possible to utilize the mixed and dirty plastic waste we create in our households. You can already find the first bins of its kind, made from their own plastic waste. This is a very big step forward in completely new standards for our demands for recycled plastic. Oh, and by the way, we're making huge CO2 savings by moving the resources from incineration to repeated circular recycling processes that will last for decades. When the plastic waste is collected from the citizens, Renault Nord handles the important pre-sorting and extraction of the plastic waste for the further treatment. With hand-picked partners, Rag and Cells refines the plastic waste through complex mechanical processes, transforming the waste into resources, pelletized and ready for production. There are no shortcuts to ensuring a consistent high quality, so that's what we do, ensuring a high quality control to meet the highest standards. PWS never compromises on quality. And that's no easy task with recycled post-consumer plastic. But the message from EU is clear. New innovative processes is demanded to combine the highest quality with the most critical plastic resources. The big question is how. How is it possible to mass produce a bin that can cope a fall of three meters? Withstand extreme temperature differences at the highest certified standards for bins, made from resources catapulting sustainable plastics to new heights. It is with the right people and mindset. Thank you, Rebuild, for sorting your plastic waste. Now we can recycle your plastics in new bins many times and by doing so, securing our resources for the decades to come. So a quite powerful story from, from the citizens in Rebil. They can see that the plastic they sort and put in the bin out there, make an effort, it comes back in a bin again. <laughs> so it makes it very, very feasible, likable for them to do it, that they, they, they are their own raw material deliverer, <laughs> so to say, in, inside of this. So very interesting. So what we also do just shortly uh, in Rangsels, 
we walk the talk. We have to. We can't go out to say to municipalities and everybody else, you have to do this, not doing it ourselves. So we're introducing a program now in, in Rangsels where we will make our bins and our bags also of this material. It's under the, the word in Lösning Jord of Problemen, a solution made of the problem. So, so this is also, we lose a lot of bins in Rangsels. We lose a lot of bags. So we really have the possibility also to, to do this ourselves and, and walk the talk. So a very important point for us as well. Then last question for me, I just want to raise here at the end, because it's something I'm often faced with. Is it affordable? Does it pay off to do this? And I would argue that it does. And let me just point to a few things. Uh, not many are aware of this, but actually a contribution to being a member of the EU has been set up and we are paying to this uh, different taxes and so on. But a new tax that EU has implemented is a tax that every nation in EU has to pay 0 0.8 cent per kilogram of plastic packaging waste that they are not able to recycle. So this is actually a very large figure coming up for the countries. So if you look at this from the social point of view, from everybody's wallet's <laughs> point of view, it is highly feasible to move it away from incineration and, and into new projects or into new products. And we, we are really advocating that these money are spent to develop this instead. Right now they're just taken from somewhere, but we, we would really like that these money are spent in developing this instead uh, to, to, do, to do so. Uh, let me also just talk about the wind turbines in Denmark, you know them, big thing now. But I don't know if you knew that in the 60s, uh, the wind tube turbines were, were also something you started in Denmark, but it was shut down. And it was the Windkraft Uvalet that did this, a big organization under the government in Denmark said it's not affordable, it can't compete against the oil. <laughs> so it was shut down. I don't know, do anybody know why it was taken up again? <laughs> no. The oil crisis in the 70s. Suddenly, it was not feasible <laughs> anymore to use oil. So we went back to the windmills or the wind turbines, starting to producing them again. And all the way, if you look at the histories to the 70s and the 80s, it's a big history of, of, of failing. Uh, they tried to make the wings out of wood again, and then they went back to glass fiber, and back and forth, the wings fell off. They had a lot of technical problems. But look at where we are today. And nobody argues that it's not feasible today. And, and this is really my point here, that, that uh, the resource is not wind, no, it's waste. <laughs> but but it's, it's actually the same story. We just need to get started on this one. It will become feasible, of course. It's waste. It's not digging up oil. It's natural. But there is a starting point where it may not look feasible uh, from a very narrow point of view, but in the big picture it is. And then my, my really final point here that you can answer for yourself what is the price for not doing it? I don't know if you want to calculate this, but this is going to be huge if we're not making this transition. So this brings me finally to fair plastic, and, and fair plastic is that despite it's difficult, not up in the system against the linear economy, and, and we have to face a lot of issues, we simply think it's unfair to continue not to recycle from pile two. On the other hand, we think it's fair to recycle from pile two. And this is what fair plastic is. This is a guarantee stamp from, from Rangsels that we're taking from pile two, bringing into raw material and into new products. We are standing behind this. But there's more to it than this. It's also a, a, a vision or a thought concept, if you want to, uh, that we want to drive with this. And it can really be put down to one word that's so important for us to stress out, not just for plastic, but for many other waste types as well. It's, it's, it's demand. We want to create demand. And the point is, if you get this product demanded, then you can really move on things. And I think uh, John Lennon has this, this song, Imagine. So if we should imagine big, think big, <laughs> it's allowed sometimes. But what if we could make this pile too to be attractive, to be valuable, to be, to be something that's demanded in the entire world? Would we throw it into the ocean? <laughs> would we burn it? No, we would collect it, like we do with metal scrap. It, it has a value, and, and I think that's really what something we could help each other by doing, bringing a value into the raw material of plastic waste and away from, from virgin. Th then we could really move something. So all is uh, collected in uh, a movie we have made about this. Do we have the time here? So this is just summing up what we have talked about. So let me uh, show you this. You can also share this with others. 
course. 50% of plastic packaging must be recycled by 2025. Since day one, the linear economy has postponed the very consequences of our plastic production and handling, leaving us with a mountain of problems. Of all the plastics ever produced, we have only managed to recycle 9%. 12% is incinerated. The rest is left behind somewhere. And the mountain is growing with an expected doubling of plastic usage within the next 30 years. In Denmark, 30% of all plastic waste is recycled. It's clean and uniform types of plastic waste that has been recycled in solid processes for decades. It's all good, but it's clearly not the answer to the plastic plague. The vast majority of the global plastic waste is mixed and dirty. Only few wants to touch it, and with good reason. The linear economy has made it unprofitable to recycle. Instead, we let our beloved Earth pay for the enormous consequences. In the EU, the total demand for recycled plastic is less than 10% and guess from which source. That's not fair. We have to ask ourselves, where would all the remaining plastic waste end up? If we also demanded this resources to be used in the new plastic products, there is no need to throw money into the ocean or burn great resources. Fair plastic is a mechanical recycling of these untapped resources. And with strong partnerships and value chains, we can ensure a safe way back for these resources into all kinds of new plastic products. The result is a sustainable circular solution, creating huge CO2 savings. But the effort is worthless without your demand of this recycled plastic. In fact, there's no point in collecting or sorting plastic waste at all if it only leads to a dead end. Don't be the missing link in the crucial circular process. The challenges we've created together, we must also solve together. Ask for fair plastic today and buy your own plastic waste again and again and again. And again. So, hope it makes sense. Thank you so much, Kenneth. I think it's impressive. I think everybody feels that it's impressive what you have done in Denmark and what mm. we're now trying to share to the world. Already in, in February this year, we had one of our circular table talks. That's Rangsell's uh, own TV channel that we broadcast on, online. And more than 800,000 people watched that show, and it was about plastic. Mm. We had PWS, one of the partners, part of the show, from the Netherlands. Yeah. So it's a, it's a partnership cross borders. We also had the, the, the plastic bags manufacturer, Standard. also part of that show. But we also had uh, uh, from WWF in US, uh, the plastic export expert, of course, we had represented from UNEP in, 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 in Cairo as well. Mm. So uh, I think that, that the interest for our your solution are really global. Mm. Uh, what do the, when you talk about Coop, because this is a new one, I haven't heard that before. When will the bottles be there in the, in the shelves? We've, we've already made the first test production there, but uh, I, it's a good point because it's really about quality. We don't want to bring something to the shelves that don't have the right quality. So our partner, it's a partner called Shela Plus that produces those bottles. They have asked for not just one batch to try to make it, but they have asked for three batches because they are very afraid that the quality will differ <laughs> because it's coming from different batches. So we're making three batches now. The first are approved. So we're making three batches over time and then they are making the, the most difficult of the bottles with a handkerchief on it. Uh, and if this goes through the testing period, the migration test and so on, what we expect, then Coop is ready to put it on the shelves as the first one. And then they are actually willing to switch their entire program. And it's more than 200 tons they're using alone in Denmark uh, for this, if it goes well. But it's a step-by-step -step process because we don't want to compromise on quality. And, and that's very understandable all for also for our, for our partners. But we're quite far. Yep. Any questions uh, before we take the next? Yeah, we have a question here. Yes, um, my name is Lina, I come from EON, the energy company. You mentioned traceability and uh, 
I would like to know why that is so important, mm -hmm. and is it really realistic to require traceability when you are tackling this huge pile of plastic? Yeah, it, 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 first of all, it, it is very important because all the buys the plastic, a um, lot of the, the, the plastic products that are bought today, you need the traceability to see what kind of chemicals are inside or if they, if they use it for UN uh, approved uh, canister or something like this, you need to have traceability inside of it. So it is, as of now, uh, very, imp very important. But the question is, if it's needed or it's just a regulation that has been made that could be some find, something we could talk about but but it is important for this and and the the question is uh, can it be done in the mixed plastic maybe there are some uh, initiatives going on about water mar marking where you put a watermark inside or a passport uh, product passport on the on the packaging itself so you can identify the plastic packaging and you shoot it out by near then you can actually have a traceability but it's a long shot and, and it's going to be difficult so the question is should we should we change the regulation or should we work on the on the on the um, uh, traceability but it, it's a fair and good question yeah. and Sergio, as Kenneth said we are really dedicated to change from origin to quality perspective but our linear system says it's the origin that determines and that's the reason why it's no problem to use phosphorus from Morocco with high content of cadmium and uranium because we know it's dirty. We know exactly how dirty it is. But uh, the unknown, we don't have these quality measures. And that's, that's the problem. That's why we can't really go circular yet. Thank you, Kenneth.